first step, we want to build, create a billion dollar company. The first thing what we really want to do is we want to solve a million euro problem. And um, last week, you might attended the GTEC and you heard that it was mentioned Berlin is a city for the society. So this is a problem we see in society, we see in real estate business, and we want to solve that problem. It is typical for German processes in real estate management, or in real estate transfer, let me say this in that way. So the key element is, uh, suppose you, you want to buy an apartment here in Germany. You want to buy a flat or something like this. What kind of steps you have to, to do? You go to the notary and you sign the contract and you go out and say, yes, I am the owner of the apartment, but you're not. There are so many steps you have to take uh, to become the owner. It's a long, it's a hard way and it's due to the German law and it's a typical German law where we have to take into account. But one of the first aim you want to have is you want to get that uh, priority notice of conveyance because then it is blocked. No one else can um, claim anything. So it is your kind of insurance that no one else can claim something that he is maybe the next buyer or something he push you out or things like that. So this is very, very important for you in the whole process. It's the first step. It's only the first step, but it's a very important step. And you know, when you um, order something uh, at Amazon, you go and you write, or you, you want to buy a book, for example, for three euros or something like this. You have that tracking, you have your, your number, you know right now in what kind of process you are. Unfortunately, we do not have the same in German transfer, transferring of ownership. So that's the kind of black box syndrome. You do not know where you are right now. It's not trackable. And that's the problem. And we wanted to solve, Pro Project Hurricane wanted to solve that problem with the blockchain. So that's it. We have uh, a time span. It takes, if we use an optimistic uh, kind or point of view, we have six to eight weeks to get that uh, notice uh, or that, that, that we can block, that we can say, okay, this is, it will be uh, our apartment, our flat, something like this. And we want to reduce with the blockchain that time span. That's, that was the idea. So you are all, like me, blockchain enthusiasts, so you know all the pros about the blockchain. I do not have to tell you something about that. But uh, the major or the, the real important thing is we sign the contract and then we put the whole next steps on the blockchain. We use the blockchain and we say, okay, notary enters a transaction on the blockchain. They send it to the land registry and they accept it. And then after they accept it, they are able to confirm it. And you all know how much or how long will that take. It's not such a long time span. And in comparison to six to eight weeks, we can do this within, let me say, 10 minutes, one hour. So that, that we can reduce that time span significantly. And this will help you to reduce the, um, the unsecurity. You really do not know what's going on in the time when you are signing the contract till you get that um, confirmation that you are in the um, section 2 of the land title registry. And what can happen in that time span? We all do not know what can happen. It could be possible that, for example, there is a tornado, there is a hurricane who is going to destroy your new apartment, your new house, or there is vandalism or things like this. Who is in charge when something like this happens? Who is responsible for this? What, ha do, what kind of steps do you need to, uh, to do to solve that problem? Because the seller, he said, I sold this. We went to the notary. And you, who are you? You are somewhere in a kind of gray zone. And this is what we want to solve. And this is what we could solve with the blockchain. So we're ready to fly. Come on, let's fly. Yeah. The schedule. 
The concept about that business idea I created, I started to create it in August 2015. So what, how to do and, and uh, what is necessary and so on, the complete steps. The first, I would like to say, really important uh, milestone we achieved in the um, first quarter of 2016, we uh, found partners. The crew is on board, let me say it in that way. So we have uh, an IT partner who is able to support us in the way we need the support. And we also have venture capitalists. We have that letter of intent uh, about yeah, 5 million euros. So they are willing to uh, give us that kind of amount. So that's a really huge first step what we have done. And we are proud about that. But the next step, the second one, the second milestone, I would like to say this is a much bigger success what we uh, achieved because boarding is completed. All relevant partners are at the table and we discussed the important things with them. What are the important things? What are the relevant partners? We went up to the, as you can see, uh, Bundesjustizministerium um, and Bundesnotariatskammer. And we talked with the CEOs with the really uh, a uh, major important person who are able to decide whether to use this or not. So I would like to say that this was really a big success to get them at the table and to discuss that project. Yeah, Bundesjustizministerium, let me say, uh, the, the guy he was um, in charge, he was the Referatsleiter für Sachenrecht und Grundbuchrecht. So as you might see, this is a really a huge title and he was, he was responsible or he is responsible for these things. He could hardly believe that this is possible to solve these problems with the blockchain. He was very surprised about that. He said, okay. Hmm. We, learned, we learned several things from that talk. <laughs> as you can see, landowner registry is already digital. Wow. Wow. And it took more than 10 years to make it in that way. So that process still works. Very interesting for us, only two software packages are in production. So if we go into that field, we only have to work with two um, yeah, software packages for the whole Bundesländer. This is very important, not only for one state like Berlin, for all Bundesländer. Very easy for us to do this from the IT part. <sighs> but assignment process is still analog. So the whole communication, all the processes are still analog. No digital processes are there. They wanted to use the digital uh, signature. Uh, they, they, they are willing, yeah, at least as you can see, to use the digital uh, signature <laughs> process. And they start a test run in this summer uh, for Schleswig-Holstein or in Schleswig-Holstein. And they look for some other uh, Bundesländer to, to, to try this. But, you know, they are very uh, slowly and they say, okay, let's start with one Bundesland and that, that will be okay. And to say it in a very politely way, the official bodies don't share our assessment. Uh, they said, we think it is not necessary to have transparency. We don't want to have transparency in the process and we do not want to have transparent data. So that's it. No chance for us to implement that blockchain idea here in Germany. Because, and again, that were the person, they are really in charge and they could decide. This was not only, you know, some guys somewhere in a row for, I don't know, some normal employees. And they say, no chance. No chance for anybody to use blockchain. The, the, we, they think they are really upfront while using digital signature. Yes, that's it. But we learned, we learned a lot. And we learn also there are some hard facts because, you know, legal aspects, takeover of sovereign examination, that is a problem we need to discuss. But we could solve this problem. That was not that huge problem for us. We can say, okay, that's a hard fact and hard facts you can discuss. But there are also some soft facts. And the soft fact, one of the major soft facts is they fear 
they fear that they're going to lose their jobs. Because what will happen when something like the blockchain is implemented? We're going to lose our jobs. And this is something what we cannot do. So we'll never use that blockchain system. No. And how will you argue against soft facts? That's, you know, that's, that's the, the big difficult. And that's it. Project Hurricane, we go abroad. Thank you for your attention. Check in is starting. Maybe you would like to join. So I would like to fly and I will make these things. Yeah, I make that take off. Um, hopefully we can do this together. Thank you. Oh, yes, of course. Maybe um, there are some questions. Sorry for just, this. Just maybe when somebody asks a question, repeat the question so that... Uh, of course. Yeah. You're the first. So, impressive. Um, my question is, what are your next steps or what is your next project? Uh, first, you, you ask me the next, uh, for the next step. The next step is... Um, we go abroad, so this idea is brilliant. And again, you might have attended the GTEC last week, and there was, a, I would like to say, a similar project with Ghana, and there the government is behind that project. So they, they are able to solve that problem in a much easier way than we can solve that problem here in Germany. <laughs> but right now I have a kind of collaboration with, uh, uh, with the um, uh, fin with Finland, and uh, they are looking for some solutions. So we are still discussing, and this is it's it's on its way. Keep our fingers crossed that it will work. <laughs> Your question. Yes, yeah, this question was a similar one, or specifically in what for what countries are you? Yeah, the, the, the first step we're going to do is we go to Finland, and the next one is uh, Switzerland. You might have heard about that Switzerland is also very uh, interested in blockchain, and uh, right now I think Canton Souk uh, is the one who's, uh, who allows that you pay your taxes in Bitcoin. So I guess we can enter that open gate, so maybe we have the chance. So we'll, ch we'll check and we'll try. Yeah, it's Estonia. It it's all, could also be a, a, a good idea, but you know, these are the first step, and one step after the other. So, yeah. Yeah, um, there are many problems with uh, real estate. Why did you choose real estate? Uh, you asked me why did I choose real estate? Real estate because, uh, yeah, uh, I have a very strong footprint in real estate because before I started my career at the university, I worked almost 20 years in the real estate industry. So I have a I would like to say a huge background. I know about the processes and I know that they are very slow, traditional thinking and things like this. So, yes, uh, that is the, I, I would, you know, I like the uh, uh, blockchain, I like the IT world, and I like to combine these two things. And that was, for me, it was natural, it was obviously that, you know, using that, <coughs> these two parts and combine them. I have two questions. One is, who was the guy from the <laughs> and the second one is um, what did Rosalia Aspana say about blockchain technology? Okay, you ask me who was the guy from the Bundesjustizministerium. Uh, you will understand that I don't want to name him because, you know, he said no and he, he had really problems <coughs> to understand. The only thing what I ca like to tell you, how I like to refer to his words was he said, how can you dare to questionize a 120-year-old law. 120-year-old. And you coming up with such a revolutionary idea, how can you dare? So, you know, that was the amazing thing. I really, I loved that. And I said, okay, we are on the right track. Even we failed, <laughs> but we are on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was. And um, the guys from the Bundesnotariatskammer, um, the technical guy, he understood very quick and fast what's going on. But he mentioned that, yeah, that could be a good idea, could really brilliant, but it took us more than 10 years to implement the, the first step for a digital signature in German government. So, well, if you are willing to invest 15 or 20 years, for implementing blockchain in German bureaucracy, you're welcome. And I said, no, 
that time, I don't have that time, so I understood him. Lesson learned. <laughs> Some more questions? Yeah. I thought about going in the uh, Department of Justice from like one level higher and addressing. Well, the next step would be Bundesjustizminister Maas. Yeah, but 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 you know, <laughs> but but you know, uh, that that is one problem. Uh, even if we can convince, or I can convince uh, Mr. Maas, yeah. and I I'm pretty sure that I can do that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, oh, uh, um, is he really able to convince the lower levels in his? <sighs> can you replace all of them? You know, think about, think about the guy who said a 120-year-old law. And that's the thinking. And you know, never forget, real estate business is a traditional industry, very traditional. And you know, they, they have a lot of fears when something is too fast. So what's going on? What will happen? Oh my God, no. But did they actually have some reasons, content-wise, why they don't, don't like blockchain? You mentioned the... the it's new. It's revolution. So, no. Just no. Even it's better. So you didn't get the content. We, 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 we told, uh, me, I told all and everything about the content. What is the blockchain for? What kind of benefits you see? And so on. The whole thing. We told them. And the guy from the Bundesnotariatskammer, he understood. Uh, yeah, from Bundes yeah, he understood. But the guy from Bundesjustizminister, my God, what's there? Mm -hmm. And again, uh, no, no, no chance. And that was really, they, it was the, the highest level, the one level under Mr. Mas. So, and I would like to say that is a kind of success for us and our company. So again, yeah, I, I'm very proud about that. That we, there's one word, fail, but fail fast. So this is what we did. We failed fast, so we, we did not burn too much money here in Germany. Why not? Um, if, if you create something totally revolutionary, if you go to the regulators, they will say no. Um, did, you, did you speak with um, a real estate uh, company? Yes. Yes. Yeah, but, but do you know that the. Um, Again, I have to uh, repeat your question. I spoke with uh, real estate companies, and this is also the reason why, you know, that's a huge amount of venture capital. Where is it from? Just to, to give you an overview, we, I did my talks, and I have my connection in that uh, field, so I know where, w w with whom I should talk to. But, uh, and they are totally convinced. They say, yeah, come on, go, and let's do this. But unfortunately, not unfortunately, that's, that's the typical German way how to uh, transfer uh, ownership. On the one side, it is you know 120 year old law, but it's very secure. So we have that for I principle and it works. So we have not really so many um, damages in the whole market instead of other markets that, that how to uh, transfer the ownership. But you know, the, the authority, they still say no. No, and again, no, for no reasons. It's not logical, nothing. But they say still, no. We have to accept that. So we have to come up with a way that makes like blockchain looking nice to these people that you want to replace. Well, like, like for how? instance, like WhatsApp looks nice to us, you know, <laughs> but it, hij it hijacked our communication, okay? So we, we have to find a way so that blockchain looks nice and appealing to the people at first hand. And that's, that's, that's my task to make it uh, that they feel more familiar, more, more um, yeah, yeah, that they feel better with that. And this is the reason why I want to go abroad, to implement the whole uh, system abroad. And then I can come back home and say, hello, here I am, and let's start again. I'm in contact with these guys, and I'm gonna uh, I try. You know, uh, sometimes I, th there are s some small signs, and they s show me, yeah, it was not completely crazy what you mentioned. It okay. sounds quite good, but but again, 120 years old, no. So, yeah, and that's it. 
Um, if you could again mention the um, time efficiency that, um, that your system would bring and whether you had uh, done any studies um, that showed how it would affect, if at all, market behavior in real estate as perhaps one of the justifications of your guys. I repeat your question. So um, the time um, significance you wanted to know, uh, how, what, how, what kind of effects are visible, and uh, the second part was... The, the attendant effects that yeah. efficiency would have on yeah. uh, real estate. Um, again, it is a complete black box syndrome. You Nowadays, when you're going to sign your contract, you go, you sit at the notary, you sit at the table, you sign it, you do not know what will happen afterwards. You know that the notary will send uh, the contract to the land registry. But nothing, no one will know what, what's going on there. And there are some uh, things that could happen that there could be a kind of damage or that your seller sells twice, once to you and the next day to someone else. And there could be some circumstances or things can happen that the second one, the second guy in a row, will be the first, and then he is the one who claimed it's my, and I'm the next owner. So this, these, these things you can avoid with while using the blockchain. And um, yeah, what will happen? For example, for uh, yeah institutional investors, you're much quicker. You, you claim you, you can claim it much quicker and therefore you can use that property much quicker instead of nowadays so that there is a, also a real huge uh, monetary effect visible for all of them. Maybe it's wrong to talk to the middleman to implement the new technology. Maybe you should like talk to the end user to actually use it. I know in real estate it will be like very difficult yeah. but for instance in bitcoins we didn't talk to banks whether they want to buy bitcoin, we talked to the end user that's a good idea. I'll take it with me and, and think about it. But how, how? I mean, in the real estate, it will be like very hard because it's like something that's like very deep in our law. It is. It is very deep, but it, because you know, you you are always connected to the laws. And you cannot, even if we all, as the community, say we want to have that system because it's quick, it's fast, it's secure, nothing can happen. You, we all know the benefits of the blockchain, yeah. but um, we do not have the power to convince the government in that way. I don't know who who, who is. Uh, are you aware of um, systems like the house lily card? Uh, not. Which is actually it's a it's a limited liability partnership yeah. construct where the company just owns part of the house mm -hmm. that is not sold to other people. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, there is a man, uh, middleman in a way. Okay. They own the house, but the people which actually own the flats yeah. more have a, a contract to this lease of the card instead of to the country. But, um, yeah, but the, the, the major problem is that you somehow you are, uh, um, you, you need to use the German law. You, it is, it is. It, it's one layer between, you, you, you just put one intermediate, one third party in, in that yeah, role. Yeah. yeah, and this is done by some but, uh, um, betriebswirtschaftlich, uh, uh, Well, one question, one critical question from my side, you know, we are all, we all like blockchain, we all like bitcoins, so what we all want to have is we want to um, yeah, not eliminate but we, we want to reduce the power of third parties. And again when you came up with that <coughs> thought, we involve a new third party in that process and this is something I would like to make it easier. So sorry for this but this is a way I, I would not like to follow. I, make it, I would like to have that peer-to-peer, -peer, the direct contact, not someone in between. And if someone in between is, that, that would be not so, it would not convince me. First one, did you try petitioning uh, to get like, the masses to uh, force the parliament to uh, think about that topic? And second one, no. um, since you raised venture capital or about to raise venture capital, uh, it has to have some co commercial way of recouping the money, do you charge the government like a one-time fee or do you intend to like 
yeah, transaction fee from Transfer or what's the, what's yeah, the we want to we want to have a, a transaction fee uh, based on the um, um, purchase price, uh, and therefore it's about uh, uh, um, yeah, very small transaction fee. But we all are still talking about a huge amount of when you buy your apartment and things like this. So even if you go and, and have uh, one thousand uh, percentage of the completely contract, uh, the amount is very high what you'll get so that that's okay and you uh, the uh, government ha yeah i would like to say they need to put, need to put need to participate sorry and uh, also the notary services they need to participate so that's important that we um, we thought about this and we implemented them in the whole process of the flows but again you know that the, the, the advantages were, were for all of the participants but the regulatory set. No way. No chance. Petitions? Once again? Petitions? The first question? Did you try to petition it? No, I haven't tried that. So I again, thank you very much. It's a good idea. I will think about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two more questions. Two more questions, so then we have to stop. So it's you. Yeah. It's a private blockchain. It should be a completely private blockchain uh, just for the government. And yeah, I understand the benefit is to apply by the situation during this uh, green zone period where you don't know who the property belongs to. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> why don't you sell your service as a, um, what is it called, an arbitrage service between the seller and buyer that uh, uh, who's, who is going to be in the like an escrow, room. yes, you're right. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, and then that way you don't need to have to involve the regulators. But you are in the whole, you know, we are going to transfer a property in Germany. And you are always connected. I'm not meaning that you're going to bypass the existing system, but just you're going to provide this service during this but, but what is what is the benefit for for the participant? What what kind of benefits do they have? Again, it is yeah. Yeah, but you cannot replace the notaria because it's also uh, it's linked to the it's linked to our law. You cannot replace it. Yeah, but you, you know, again, sorry for this, but you cannot replace the law, once again. And also notaria services, they are a part of the German transfer law. And we cannot say, we skip that. You're right, there are several things that we can do and we'll, how, how to take this into account, what kind of solution. But again, it is connected to our law and the German law says, you need to go to the notary, you need to sign the contract in front of the notary, and then the whole process can start. And again, the Bundesjustizministerium, the person in charge, Referatsleiter für uh, Grundbuchrecht und Sachenrecht, he denied, he said, no chance. So that's it. So again, we have some laws and we must take them into account. That's, that's the problem. But I would like to share my experience with you because I think there are some guys here in the room who also like to do something with land registry and so on because it is a huge market where you can make a lot of money. And you know, even if we are in Berlin and we like the society and we like to do something for the society, we are also entrepreneurs and we also like to make money. And that's one of the reasons why we're here. So yes, but we have to wait. We have to find other ideas not here in Germany right now. Thank you for your attention. Let's change.
All right, so let's get started for the second talk. So it will be about um, governance of DAOs in general. And of course, in those days uh, today, if you talk about DAOs, you can't skip the DAO that's currently going on. So we will also, I will also give you some insights into the DAO, but um, we will go there step by step. Uh, first slide, I can skip that. So, or I mean, I'm, I'm involved for quite a while in the space, started the Bitcoin prediction market, working now mainly on Ethereum, doing research on this future key, this decentralized governance mechanism based on a prediction market, also scalability solutions, off-chain transactions, lightning network-like things for, um, for Ethereum, and I'm currently living in the Bay Area and hosting there the Ethereum meetups in the Bay Area and in, in um, San Francisco. So um, two que or maybe three questions that I um, get my timing right. So where where to spend the most of most of the time? So who of whom of you is familiar with Ethereum? Okay, great. Then I can skip this this slide. Whom of you is familiar or knows what is a DAO? And, all right, so also pr most of, and finally, who knows, or, or next question, who knows what a prediction market is? Okay, okay. And finally, um, Futaki, Futaki, never know how to pronounce it correctly. Okay, that's only few, that's, okay, great. Then I can focus on, on that. So I, I yeah, I am, why Ethereum? Well, um, basically it makes life easier. So with Bitcoin, a lot of things are in theory possible. With, Bit, uh, with Bitcoin, yeah, a lot of things are in theory possible. With Ethereum, in my opinion, they get um, practical. So I, we tried to build a decentralized prediction market with Bitcoin where we would not hold the money, but it would be in a contract or multi-thick or whatever with opcodes. It's really hard. Maybe it's possible. We didn't achieve it in two years with Ethereum. It took us a uh, us, yeah, few months. Um, okay, but now with Ethereum, um, more things more things are possible actually it's possible to to bring a whole organization um, on on the blockchain so a dao so where did it came from it d didn't came from from nothing so there were, first there was this concept of app coins um, this idea yeah you you want to raise money for a new company um, what what Brian, what was this messaging? GEMS, right. So GEMS, GEMS that, that's one example. I think there have been a b bunch of others. So uh, use blockchain to yeah, raise money, create a token, and maybe some, somewhat you, you need this token to, uh, to interact with the company or use the service the company is providing. However, um, there is little accountability. So you raise the money once uh, in the beginning, you ha have all the money, and then it's really still traditional structures or mm, who has access to the money, who's accountable for it. All those things are, are not on the blockchain. Um, and the goal of DAOs is to bring them also on the blockchain. So a DAO is basically a corporation where all the laws and rules of the corporation are written as smart contracts. Uh, I would say, uh, it is a continuous spectrum uh, between a smart contract and a DAO. So smart contract can be if someone, if, if A, then B. So th that is a very simple smart contract. Is this already an organization? Maybe not. Uh, where does it start? Where would we, at, at w from what point would we call it an organization? I think that it is a continuous spectrum. However, there is also this o the other end where it's clearly something like an organization something that can hold assets, money, but also tokens of other organizations, tokens of whatever, maybe at some point uh, land titles. Um, it can uh, employ people, it can make decisions or um, act yeah, as an actor. Um, so one question will be how 
how do we come to those decisions, and we will go into this. Um, yeah, usually the ownership of a DAO is expressed in a simple token. We all know those, uh, like shares. Um, and it, this intermediates, or one, another way to look at it at DAOs is it disintermediates uh, the shareholders from the execution. So in a traditional company, once in a while, every year, there is um, yeah, uh, Gesellschafter Versammlung, shareholder, well, meeting. shareholder meeting, right? And few people come there, maybe 10, 20% 20, 20 of the shareholders, maybe less, uh, they vote or they, they can vote on some things, but it's, 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 um, it's quite, uh, it, it's, it's not directly. And, and with, with the DAO, it would be possible that voting is continuous. You can vote on, on every issue. You can, um, it's super simple. You don't have to come to the Vollversammlung. Um, it's just a click on the button. Um, and it's directly enforced. So there is no, um, it, it's not you, you vote for it and then someone has to execute it or in, in, the, in the other example it would be, well, there's this payment and finally there's a settlement. Uh, like, like in Bitcoin, the, the voting would directly trigger the decision and it would be directly, or it can be the case that it's directly executed. Right, so let's come to um, the DAO. So a few weeks ago this same, uh, the same talk would be purely, um, well, maybe in the future we will have it. Now we have it and it's pretty exciting. So that is from, from t today in the morning. Let's, let's have a look at the <laughs> live numbers. So the, the DAO is, or the DAO is, it's basically a decentralized uh, venture, venture fund. So how does it work? People can put in money. In return, they get tokens. Those tokens represent A, uh, a share in, in, in this project, and they represent B, a voting right. Um, and then this DAO mainly, what it mainly does is it will invest in other projects. We will come this, to this in a moment. Uh, just impressive numbers. Currently, it holds 100, uh, 65 mil, uh, million, or Ether with the value of 164 or 5 million uh, US dollars. So those are the live transactions that you can see currently. Uh, so every minute there is going more, more money into it here. Uh, yeah. S anyway. Okay. Back to, um, to the presentation. Um, again, it's, it's, what is it? It's mainly a decentralized um, venture fund. So the idea is uh, the DAO hires or um, basically gives someone money. The contractor, they promise to build a product. Um, the product can have components that are on the blockchain, can have pro components that are off the blockchain, but mostly interesting are those that live on the blockchain. Let's say a marketplace for something. With marketplace, people can buy and sell something, and a small fee is taken on the blockchain with every transaction on this, uh, that, that interacts with the smart contract. And this fee, this um, revenue, would go back um, to uh, the DAO. So again, uh, people can make proposals. More or less everyone can make a proposal. Uh, you have to be shareholder, but you ha can have an infin infinite small amount of shares. Um, then as soon as you make a proposal, and a pro proposal can look like, uh, please send five million to this contract, to my contract. And uh, my contract specifies, for example, I can, over the next two years, I can, um, I can, uh, yeah, withdraw so and so much. So five million divided by 24 or something like that. And then you could have things like the DAO could, uh, I mean, basically any kind of contract. So uh, that's a proposal. Um, and then the um, DAO shareholders will vote for it. If a quorum, so at least current rules are at least 20% have to vote for it, that the vote is valid. And then you have 
to win the vote also. You have to get at least 50x percent voting for your proposal. And then it will be executed. Um, then hopefully uh, people will, um, or the ones who made the proposal will develop something, will, de will be deployed, and maybe the process starts uh, from the beginning. So that's really a huge thing. So it is a revolutionary new way to organize a, a, a company. It offers total transparency, um, total shareholder control, and it reduces the entrance barrier uh, tremendously. So let's imagine in, in today's world or in yesterday's world, uh, if you would um, start a venture fund and would like to collect 150 million, I guess usually the smallest amount to participate in such a venture would be a million, maybe more. Um, today you can participate with five euros. Um, that's one point. Another point is uh, just the legal paperwork, I guess just the legal contract of, um, of a venture fund managing uh, 150 million would be 80 pages or something like that, would probably cost uh, 20,000 uh, US dollars to get it written and to, to, to get all the notary uh, improvement and all, all, all that stuff. Well, now it's a contract. A Ethereum contract with 150, maybe 150 lines of code, and once it is, um, once uh, it's or it, it, it gets better develop, developed, it will improve, and it will be super easy to fork it and to just uh, reuse it um, for the next project. So the costs will go so much, uh, will be reduced so dramatically. A few points um, why I believe um, this project is so successful um, and has raised so much money. Uh, the first two points are that the developers, and it's well known that mainly the, slock, the, the guys who, uh, who have this idea of slockets is um, uh, smart locks and uh, um, a little bit of connection between the Ethereum world and IoT. Uh, they, they, they made it, but um, they resisted the, ten the temptation to, for example, take a fee. So I would say even if they would only take a 0.5% fee or one, one, two, a small fee, I would say uh, the success would be much, 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 much smaller. Also, they resisted the temptation to give them some kind of extra role. Um, so they made it really decentralized. In the end, it really doesn't matter um, that, that they uh, created the thing. They don't have any extra role. So I think those two factors are um, uh, extremely important for the success. But also the next two factors, and they are, they, uh, I think it's important to mention them because they, um, they bring a, this big numbers a little bit in perspective. So, and, and now it, I'm going a little bit really into the details, but I think it's, yeah, it, it is important because um, it is, if there is no, if there is no other rule set, if it's only those 150 lines, then it's really important to understand them line by line or, I mean, you maybe you don't have to be a programmer, but at least you have to, I would say like you would uh, ask a lawyer if, if there's an 80 page uh, document and you would sign it, well, now you should ask a programmer and, and um, yeah, so look at it um, line by line. And um, so there are two reasons um, why I would think the um, um, more money is raised than eventually will also go into, uh, into real projects. So, so um, one is this free option argument. Uh, what is a free option? A free option is something where you, where you basically can't lose, or you, 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 um, so you, you can do something, and then um, it, it, it doesn't cost you something, but maybe it brings you an option um, 
uh, that, that you can make some profit. And that's exactly what's, what's happening here. So in the, in, the, in the contract of the DAO, it is still possible uh, to pull your money out. So um, there is currently this creation period. Everyone can put money in. Then at some point, um, the creation period is over. And from this moment on, uh, people can submit proposals, so ask for funding. But as a shareholder, you still have the option to opt out uh, and basically get your, your money back, uh, the, the Ether you invested. So that, that is kind of your free or so at this point or uh, in the first two weeks, uh, you could just put in money in and you ha have the guarantee that you would get it out. So if you think that after the um, creation period uh, of four weeks, there is a chance that, um, that the, the value of the tokens will be a little bit above, um, above this. So uh, in the first days you would need to spend one ether and you would get 100 tokens. And if you assume that you will get a li little bit more than 100 tokens um, after the creation period, um, then a good strategy would be just put all your ether in, um, even if you don't intend to invest in something, and then see uh, when the creation period is over, well, just try to sell it for a small profit, and if you can't sell it for a profit, just pull your ether out. So it will be very interesting of this 160 million, uh, how much of this money will be pulled out and how much of this money will really be invested in real um, projects. So the three option argument is one thing. Um, another one is, or also it, it, it's connected to the free option thing. Why would it, um, why would the value why would the value go up? Um, well, because in the first two weeks, uh, if you put in one Ether, you would get 100 tokens. Uh, now in the next, and, and we are currently in this phase, and I would hesitate to recommend to invest in this phase. Um, I mean, I would recommend to everyone to put in five euros or something just to try it out. But in, in this phase, you, um, you only get less tokens. So over two weeks, the rate uh, declines. So uh, after two weeks, 100 tokens for one Ether. And in the next two weeks, you have to spend it's linear increase. But finally, you have to spend 1.5 Ether for 100 tokens. So that means uh, since people are still investing uh, at a, at a, um, at a worse rate than those who uh, got in initially. Um, that means now there's more money per token. So it is, uh, it is likely that, that if you just say, well, so and so much is in the DAO divided by the tokens, um, it is likely that the tokens will have a slightly higher value. value. So I think um, those two things, and, and yeah, also until now, no money is invested or n no money is committed to be invested. I'm, I, so again, I'm super excited about the thing, but, but those are three things you need to consider. Um, and it remains open um, how much money of this 160 million or whatever it will be in, in the end of the phase will really be used uh, um, for real investments. Okay, so now um, I come to to the voting process also a little bit in, in, in detail. Um, and uh, first, how it works, also what is a potential problem, and finally, how can we fix it? So um, um, first of all, the, the, the regular process is there is a proposal. Then there will be a two-week um, two uh, period to, to vote for it. Um, or you can specify the period, but it need, needs to be at least two weeks, two, between two and eight weeks. Um, and there is uh, this option to, uh, to fork uh, or to say, well, I don't, want, I, I don't like this proposal uh, and I want to pull out my part of the DAO. Why is this necessary? Well, 
if you only have voting and that's the only mechanism, uh, you can have a simple 51% attack. So if somehow 50% of the shareholders coordinate and say, well, let's screw the others, um, then they can vote for, let's pay out the whole amount to us. And that's it. And, and since it's a contract and there is no, I mean, there, there, there is no, uh, it will be hard to, or you can't complain about it, or, or it's hard to complain about it because there is not necessarily someone who could enforce uh, something because it's on the blockchain and it's, uh, uh, so, so all the benefits are, can also turn into negative things if, if you would ask for what's, what about shareholder protection? Well, let's see. <laughs> um, so there, there is, um, so that, that is the reason why we have this um, uh, fork proposal mechanism. So if there is a proposal um, to invest in something, um, there's this period of two weeks, but you can at any time make a proposal to yeah, pull your money out, basically a fork proposal. Those proposals only have a period of one week. So basically, if there's a bad proposal, you have uh, one week time to start your, since it's at least two weeks, uh, so you have one week time to start your fork proposal, uh, you vote for it, and uh, you can pull your money out. Um, one problem um, that I, I see in the concrete implementation, and, and that's something we want to fix with our uh, Futaki, um, Futaki uh, a proposal, this prediction market-based governance, we will come to very soon. Uh, so one problem is that you need to decide whether or not to fork uh, before um, the period, the voting period of the bet or of the proposal you dislike is over. So, and, and the point is, so let's say here is, is the, um, is, is the, the, the deadline of, of, of this um, bad proposal. You can vote until the very last block, and in principle, it's in the very last block, um, someone, a big shareholder, someone who holds, I don't know, 20 or whatever, in principle, a uh, very big uh, amount of shares, could uh, vote for it and execute it, uh, execute the proposal in the very next block. And you have to, execute your fork proposal before um, yeah bef before this is happening because af uh, after after the bad proposal is executed the money is just gone um, so you have to basically you have to, if you want to really be sure um, that your money will not um, be spent for this bad proposal you have to fork out before you even know whether or not the bad proposal um, will be implemented. Uh, the good thing is we can fix that. Um, and we came, or I mean, not we came up, so it, it's, it's quite, for, uh, quite a while. It is a known concept. Uh, maybe we can do something else. So maybe voting is not in, any, in every case the best um, mechanism um, <laughs> For, uh, for governance of a DAO. And maybe I will, oops, 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 oops. Um, and maybe I will, will first, before I uh, introduce the other uh, option, I will, I will share a few more thoughts why voting would maybe not be the best um, uh, solution. So one is, I call it is incentive um, asymmetry So uh, with, with voting. So on the one hand, you have someone who has a proposal who asks the DAO for five million, for example. They clearly have a very, very strong incentive, basically a five million incentive to, um, to convince everyone to, to to, mark, uh, to, to market or to, to, to do marketing for this um, proposal. So they will make maybe shiny um, videos, nice infographics and, and all this stuff. On the other hand, 
um, you have the shareholders and they, well, of course, they, they have an incentive to not invest in, um, in bad proposals. However, the incentive for a, thing, a, single, uh, a single shareholder to, to really dig into the thing and really make the due diligence, maybe uh, get information about the team and, and all that stuff that costs money or time or some, some form of costs, um, the, the, the benefit is not, um, is not directly there. So, so the easier, maybe the easiest thing would be to just fork out. And, and even if you are convinced um, that this is a bad proposal, you don't have some incentive to, to, to go in the forum and, and say and inform everyone and to share your knowledge. To, basically, you don't have an incentive to protect the others from losing their money. Simple as that. Um, so maybe we want to have um, a market-based um, a market-based decision um, mechanism. Or this, one, one second argument is: let's say there is someone in the crowd. Um, so so the the, um, the DAO uh, market market themselves as the decision is made by the wisdom of the crowd. Well, yeah. Um, however, maybe there is someone in the crowd who has a very strong opinion and who really knows um, why this is a good or a bad proposal. Um, because they personally know the team or they are very deep in the, into the topic. However, they have not really a mechanism to, to, to get kind of a bigger... Um, so their vote will be just one vote. Um, and maybe it would be better that they put something at stake and say, well, I'm really, I have a really strong opinion about it and I, I'm willing to put money behind my opinion and therefore my opinion should be um, uh, considered as, as more important. And that's exactly what um, this uh, um, Futaki, Futaki um, um, mechanism is is about. So how does it work? Instead of voting, we basically create tr for every decision uh, two tradable assets, and and then we let just the market decide um, for what the demand is higher. So this is an example um, for should we fire a CEO? But we, we, we can translate it directly um, to, to the DAO use case. So should we finance a specific um, proposal? That's our question. What we do now is, um, or the first step would be, we define a metric. What, 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 what is our goal? What is our final goal? What, want, what do we want to achieve um, with this DAO? So we have this entity that needs governance, but what is the goal of this entity? Well, uh, in, in, um, if you apply uh, um, Futaki to, to uh, may, maybe the German state, you could come up with a goal, well, maybe uh, optimize the GDP and unemployment rate and uh, um, Bildung, uh, um, education. education level, um, I don't know. You can you can have a or some environmental aspects, uh, Lebensqualität, life life quality, whatever. So you so you have, you can have a um, you can create mm, something yeah where you want to optimize for. In the DAO example, it would be pretty simple. You just um, you would say well maybe just the value of the tokens of the DAO. So the the overall value of the DAO. That is something we want to optimize for and every decision should optimize um, this, uh, this metric. So what do we do? Well, we take one DAO token and put, put it in a contract and, uh, and create two new, two, two new uh, tokens from this DAO token and one token is, will become a DAO token in the case that the de decision is implemented and the other one will become a DAO token in the case that the decision is not implemented. And then we will just allow trading with those two tokens 
and we will just put them on a, on a free market and we'll see um, what token trades higher. So, so people, when they trade it, they don't know yet if they, they so, so it's, 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 it's a conditional trade. So they have to trade under the assumption that something is happening. They don't know yet whether or not it is happening, but um, they, will, they still need to act under the assumption that the proposal is implemented. So basically, you have these two markets, um, uh, and you trade DAO tokens. So, so, uh, so also you, you do the same thing with, 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 uh, with the Ether. So you put an Ether in a contract, you create two new Ether tokens. One, uh, one becomes a real Ether if um, the proposal is implemented. The other token becomes a real Ether if the proposal is not implemented. And then you trade this DAO tokens. This one's again this Ether and the other one against the other Ether, and then you just compare. After a period of one or two week, uh, one or two weeks, you compare uh, what trades higher, and then you automatically just implement this decision, um, or the DAO would uh, automatically implement this decision. So, what are the advantages? Again. Uh, first, it, it solves this nasty uh, thing here. So, so you could say, well, I want to sell my DAO tokens if this is happening, otherwise I, I keep it. And just by this action that you sell it in the one case and you keep it in the other case, you will influence the market. So if you, you put selling pressure on, on this side, so you will drive the price uh, down. Um, and yeah, so you, you give the information into the market Instead of voting, you, you vote with your financial decision. Um, and you, uh, as a shareholder, you are in the situation, well, uh, either I get this and this amount of money out because I sell in this case, or I'm, I'm, I'm still, um, still in. Again, the other advantage is if someone is really sure about the thing, um, uh, they, they can put in a lot of more money. Um, you can go short. Uh, on proposals, yeah. So we as Gnosis, the decentralized prediction market, we uh, just made a recent uh, concrete proposal to the DAO to do things like automatically create a prediction market for every proposal and that will just be a, a standard market. Will, will this proposal be implemented, yes or no? Uh, that is already helpful to maybe create ordering of proposals. There will be tons of proposals, so you need to figure out which are the ones that, that I should have a look at because they have a reasonable chance of, of success. Uh, it, it's also directly, as soon as you have such a market, it directly gives you an option to hedge against a proposal. If you don't like the proposal, you could, yeah, kind of, so an insurance is, is the same thing as a bet. So. I mean, fire insurance is basically a bet that your house will burn down. If, if it does, you win a lot of money. If it doesn't, you lose your stake. Um, and here you can also insure against the bad proposal, so that would mean you bet on it. Uh, if it doesn't happen, okay, you're fine. Uh, you don't need the insurance. If it happens, the bad proposal, well, you at least win money in this bet. Um, so that, that's something you get for free, if, or that, that's just a side product of having markets for those proposals. Um, yeah, that's the process I just described. Um, okay, we also want to, to do a few other things. So we expect that most of, of, or not everyone will spend all their time on the internet reading all those proposals. So uh, we expect that voting participation is, is maybe not too high. So proxy voting is obviously something we uh, want to support. One thing would be this liquid, liquid democracy approach. You put your tokens in uh, somewhere and you, and you delegate your vote. You, you give others the right to vote with your tokens. Or you would put your money into, into a contract and that contract would vote. Um, so we can still use existing uh, um, the DAO um, code base. So your vote tokens would vote according to uh, the prediction market in this um, 
uh, yeah, footer key. Um, decisions all on on uh, in contracts all um, yeah so no 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 middlemen required and the good thing is if enough people would move their uh, their tokens into this contract um, we could have the transition from this voting mechanism to this um, future key mechanism uh, without creating a new DAO uh, or it could still or it could be it could be a hybrid model, so 60, 70, or 30 in the beginning, 5% of, of the voting power is under this mechanism, and the other, the, the, and, and a fraction of it is under this liquid democracy thing where you can delegate your vote, and another fraction is just pure, simple, um, direct voting. All right. Um, Okay, the last thing we, we want to do and we think is very useful is not only um, um, this one moment in the beginning where there is a team and they make a proposal and it sounds nice, so we give them uh, a million. Uh, I think it's also very important to, um, to have some control then after that. So don't give it in one chunk, but in, instead specify uh, the proposal itself. They should specify a goal. So we promise to deliver this and this and that milestones in a year, or we promise to generate so and so much revenue in a, in a year. And um, then, um, and then a good structure would be, in my opinion, that the DAO puts in already the full amount they intend to, to spend over time let's say 1 million, but they will uh, only uh, pay it in chunks every month, so and so much. And there will be a mechanism that the DAO could say, well, I, we, we stop it, this is not going forward. And here, again, the prediction market can help. So uh, the proposal, they need to specify, well, by the end of the year, we will deliver this and that. And then there will be a prediction market, uh, how likely or will, will, will they deliver this and that. And and let's say the market starts at 50, 60% likelihood, and someone really digs into this and, and, and tries to figure out how, how good on track uh, is this team, and it will, and maybe they figure out, well, they will not make it by this time, then this person can just go short on this prediction market, bet against um, uh, the success of the project, and the prediction market goes down maybe to 5% likelihood, and that, just this movement of the price could directly trigger a process in the DAO to say, well, we will now stop um, this uh, finance and we need to renegotiate. Dear team, please explain why is the likelihood so low, what's going on. Um, so kind of a real-time monitoring uh, of, of proposals, of, 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 yeah, of the steps that, um, that needs to be done after the money is uh, once promised. So I could show some things in a, um, so we, I mean, we, we have this Gnosis prediction market running. I guess I stop here and open the floor for uh, questions. Thank you very much. speculators injecting copious amounts of liquidity into the market to cloud price discovery or push it towards their own perceived outcome? Just repeat the question. Oh yeah, so the question was um, how can we provide some man man manipulation of, of the price? Of or, a or prevent, pre prevent speculators coming in, yeah, to, that would just manipulate the price for their own. Right, right, price. right. Uh, so First of all, again, to, to describe the problem, if we would um, um, transition from, from, um, from this voting approach to this market approach, um, then obviously, uh, if you want to get the five millions from the DAO, instead of trying to manipulate or, or convince uh, the, the voters, you would try to convince the market. So uh, obviously you could trade yourself in the market and um, and try to manipulate the price, or at least to bring the price at that level that that your decision will go through. 
So it's an open research topic. Uh, we just received like a month ago uh, a Ethereum grant um, to exactly ask this question and we will um, do research on it. So what we will do is we will uh, put up $10,000 and give people um, the incentive or give a small group of people uh, the incentive to manipulate a market. Uh, and if they successfully manipul manipulate the market, um, then they will get some money. And we will see. So the thing is very, the one, first experiment is very simple. We have a contract and this contract will return five. And then we have a prediction market that will predict the outcome of this contract. So it should be five, right? So, and, 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 the, and the prediction market will range from zero to 10. Um, now, I mean, in principle, everyone can just buy the price up to, uh, by just saying, well, it, I, I think it will be five, uh, 10. So I, I buy long shares and I drive the forecast up. However, everyone knows, well, the outcome will be five. Um, so now this, this bunch of manipulators, they will get um, the $10,000 uh, dollar, dollars worth of ether if they can uh, bring up the forecast. But as, as soon as they bring up the forecast, everyone should have an incentive to bring it down to five because they know, well, it's, it's five. So uh, if the forecast say, says six, then you could simply buy short shares and you have a guarantee that... Um, that you will get back so and so much money. That's simple. Um, and, or, I mean, it's already interesting how, how good and uh, how quick the market will bring back the, the, um, the price to the real price, kind of. But what about examples where it's not so, not so easy to, uh, to figure out the real price? So our next experiment will be, well, this contract doesn't return always five. It does, it returns in some case zero and in some cases 10. So you still know, well, the forecast, the average amount should be five. So the, the prediction market should return five. But if manipulators drive up the price to six, then you have to take at least some risk. So it's still a profitable trade to bring it back to five. So you know your expected value will be uh, higher than zero, but only your expected value. So uh, you, in, in, in some cases you will uh, win six, but in other cases you will lose four. Um, and we continue, we will um, do a market on, uh, we'll forecast um, the Ethereum difficulty in a month, for example. So we have one market uh, with the Ethereum difficulty in a month and another market with the Ethereum difficulty in a month plus X. So those two markets should, we know, I mean, no, no one knows exactly what the difficulty, the Ethereum difficulty in month will, will be, but we know the difference between um, those two forecasts should be X. Um, and after those uh, experiments are done, I hopefully can answer your question. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so, um, from what I understand, uh, the current uh, prediction market, we haven't had them uh, like on the blockchain, we haven't had them for long enough to know how accurate they are in terms of the outcome. Right. So, um, um, that is, okay, so this is kind of a big experiment, what you're trying. It is. Right now, because basically you're opening this unofficial playing field of manipulating opinions and, uh, and lobby lobbying, trying to lobby prices and opinions. And isn't that getting rid of the initial idea of having smart transactions on the blockchain in the first place? So I don't understand. I, I think it's quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how that would make sense. I, it feels yeah, um, I mean, uh, so uh, repeat the question. Um, 
Okay, and so, so, so the first thing, the first question was, um, do we know how prediction markets work? No, we don't. Um, so we don't know really. So uh, we, um, so we have this side gnosis. It is running for, uh, just to give you an impression. Um, yeah, that, that's currently a test version. You can predict uh, who, who becomes the next president. You can. And those also are not uh, currently not uh, for real money, uh, but we we had them running for quite a while for real money, but compar comparable small amounts, a few hundred uh, uh, dollars. So so yeah, it is still an experiment. So the, the second question was, didn't we try to get rid of human input? <laughs> Right, market. right. All the future the derivatives market are inefficient and they're like they are not real and uh, also lobbies lobbying that is happening in politics is not real and basically your experience the ex experiment that you uh, you just mm -hmm. got the ten thousand grand for making this experiment very fascinating mm -hmm. on a theoretical level. But that is basically sounds to me like lobbying. Like lobbying opinions uh, for Senate votes or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, but this is lobbying crisis. Um, yeah, I, I would say whatever um, new... So, so first of all, uh, the whole um, system should get way more efficient. So our, our hope is that those derivatives are more efficient because the entrance barriers are way, way um, smaller. But in the end, um, those kind of nasty things like manipulation, whatever, if, if you define some mechanism, people will try to manipulate the mechanism. So I, I think it's something you, let me, sorry, no, it's not, oh, it's my, my computer that's connected, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say whatever mechanism you come up with, and especially if it's purely written in code, and it's and, and uh, then people will try to will try everything and will try to manipulate it. So I think that is something that's just hard to get rid of. Also, Bitcoin, um, of course, people try to attack it. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. Kind of a derivative with a smaller, smaller market size, kind of, mm -hmm. which means you could, in, in theory, own less than 50% and still manipulate the decision for your own benefit. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I repeat the question. Um, first, how does the um, attack? or kind of attack work in, in the voting case. Yeah, a 51% uh, vote on a bad decision. And it might be way less because there's only a quorum for every decision required of 20% of the votes. Uh, so if, if 80% just don't vote, 20% vote, then of this 20%, 11% b will vote for it and 9% will vote against it, then, well, the quorum is reached of 20% and there's a majority in this quorum. So actually you can, you might be able to, with 11% of the voting power, uh, make a decision. Um, now, your question was, doesn't it get even worse with this, um, this, um, um, uh, future key um, proposal? Maybe not. <laughs> so m maybe maybe yes, maybe no. So so the thing is, uh, yes, in principle, someone who owns less than or who, who doesn't even vote at uh, who doesn't even own at all shares in in this um, in this. Uh, uh, in the DAO could could influence a decision by participating in the market. 
our assumption is, and that is something we want to prove, is that market manipulation manipulation is just very, very, very expensive. That, that's our hope. So back to this example where you try to manipulate the forecast of this contract that will return five. Well, the idea is if you buy it up to something a little bit above five, it will just instantly more or less go back to five because someone is just collecting the free money. And if you, if you push more money in it, more and more money, you will even just attract more people to, to bring it back because it's more free money. Um, so, so this is the assumption would be market manipulation is very pricey. Again, if, if the real price is known, like in this example where the, the result is five for sure, then this assumption is very likely to hold true. If the real outcome of the proposal is not known, um, then some degree of market or of, of yeah, I'm not sure if, it, if I should call it even market manipulation, but some form of influence in the market will maybe be possible. But if there's a very, very bad proposal, like send all the money to, to only a fraction of, of the shareholders, then um, yeah, I'm just very, I, I'm very, very sure that uh, if someone, um, or that it would, then again, the outcome of this decision would be very clear, like in the example where the contract just returns five, and I would say market manipulation would just be impossible. Yes. And I'm like I'm personally not very fond of democracy. I mean, it's a bit boring. It's a little small. But um, uh, so the question is, uh, if there's a running system which runs on voting, um, can, how can you move a running system to a prediction market? You just add a, like an extra contract to it, and whether uh, whether both can coexist? Mm -hmm. Like if there's one contract which deals with voting and some other people want to do prediction market whether it can coexist in the same infrastructure or yeah. ecosystem. Yeah, so the question was how is the transition or a coexistence possible between voting mechanism and, uh, and, uh, uh, and other, other mechanisms? And yes, it is. So how it would work, for example, one ex uh, um, model would be you have your, your shares, uh, your voting shares, and you can put them into a contract and now, from the DAO perspective, uh, this contract would be the owner, the owner of, of, of the shares. However, this contract would, would still uh, keep track that, that you put them in, and so later you can put them out, you can transfer them, but you give the voting right over those tokens to this contract. And this contract could implement um, something that it would, it, it could collect tokens of everyone who wants to participate, who wants to transition, or who would, who would, would like to give their voting power uh, away, and that could be, um, and there could be, it could be different mechanisms, so the simplest one would be just some delegated voting, so uh, we, we don't want to give Brian our tokens, uh, but we give maybe them, uh, we give him the voting power over our tokens, um, so that, that, that would be an option. Um, or we could give it to a contract where um, this contract can only vote by yeah, making a call to the prediction market, seeing what, what are the prices there, and then uh, the contract will automatically uh, vote according to... to uh, so the short answer is yes, it's possible, and it's even possible in a, um, without resetting uh, the system in a continuous... Uh, transition. So it's like a hybrid. Yes, hybrid model is possible, or if eventually everyone would agree, yeah, all all in between is possible. Yeah. Okay, so I have a two-part question. Mm -hmm. The first part is that um, while I think your idea is really uh, intriguing, um, one of the main concerns with prediction market in general is this classic example that if you ask what is the chance of Barack Obama being assassinated the next month, you they create the incentive of someone to put all the money on uh, like, yes, he's going to be assassinated and just do it himself, right? Mm -hmm. So um, wouldn't that be a, become a problem in this context that you wouldn't have market manipulation itself, but just have people like vote that firing the CEO would decrease the 
productivity of the company, and then afterwards, it, like actively work on manipulating the company so the value would decrease, even though it was the right decision, maybe. So this is the first part. Don't don't you think that there's a problem in itself? And then the second part is connected to that. Um, right now, I think like. 15% uh, of all ether in circulation is in the DAO. So, right. do you really think, considering that there are all these effects that we are not right now really certain how they would affect this system, mm -hmm. do you really think that it is not too high stakes mm -hmm. for you to test out this really new concept? And it's it's, it's fascinating, but it's <laughs> so new with this uh, high, uh, high amount of uh, value at stake. Right. So the first question was. Um, there is a property in a prediction market that you can, if there's something you can bet on, you can bet on it and make it happen. Um, and there are negative examples for this, where you would say, well, we don't want it. But there are also examples where you want exactly that, that behavior. So it's basically a bounty. So I, uh, I want to see a future development of of Ethereum, I want to see the transition to to proof of stake. Um, for example, that's one of the prob uh, things I, I think are very important. So, could have a market. Will Ethereum run on proof of stake by so and so? And if I want to, so in, in, instead, in, instead of just giving money to doing a crowdfunding campaign and then giving money to someone, I would just put a big bet on or as big as I want to donate, I want to. I would put a bet on it will not happen. Um, and therefore, I create a bounty for everyone who says, well, uh, there's so much uh, money on the stake uh, that it will not happen. I will, uh, yeah, make it happen and collect the money. So, um, yeah, we will have to figure out uh, in what cases we can use this mechanism you described in a positive way. And we should, or market participants should be aware of this uh, possibility. And it also depends on if, if you forecast the weather tomorrow, the sun will probably will not care about uh, the prediction market. So uh, it really depends on, on the topic. Uh, is it possible to manipulate the outcome? Do, do you want, or, I mean, manipulate is maybe a, already a negative connotation. So is it possible to influence the outcome by some actors? And of course, you should take this into uh, consideration. Uh, that, that if it, yeah, that it, it's part of the game. Um, what was the second question? Well, uh, <laughs> All right, experiment, right, right. So the, the, isn't, aren't the stakes too high? Uh, maybe. <laughs> so um, again, I, I expect that this 160 million are not, um, that, that a part of it is this free option thing, and uh, I would expect that a part of it will fork out and kind of be converted back to normal Ether. So it's really an open question how much money will really remain in the DAO. Um, but you're asking, are, isn't it too risky to try out this uh, future key thing? Well, I think it's not more or more risky than trying out the DAO thing. So I, I mean, do we know that? Uh, yeah, so uh, and since they can exist in parallel and uh, people can decide themselves whether or not they want to devote, vote directly or they want to give their vote to this mechanism, I think it, it's just another option and it should be used and should be explored. Yeah? I got a question now. Let me play the other side here. Sure. Um, there will be tens of thousands of uh, shareholders mm -hmm. and so probably tens of thousands of uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. So I definitely can't read them all. Right. So some people uh, will not have read and still be in the DAO that gets voted on. So what if I would just propose uh, sharing all the ether um, uh, for all the people that have voted? So the people mm -hmm. who have, did not vote but did not fork out. You know, right. Good point. Yeah, exactly. So so the um, so the question was, what about those people? So there will be a lot of proposals. What about those people who don't uh, people who don't read all of them? And um, what if there is some proposal that would that's an interesting proposal uh, spend the money to everyone who votes for uh, who, who vote for it? Um, well, it's basically democracy what we have now, right? 
I just want to tell you what just say, you know, I'm just sharing all the money uh, from the people that have been bought from the Yeah, kind of. But, but this is way more extreme because you can directly have a, contra uh, a suggestion that directly gives out, gives out the money to exactly the people who votes because it can track who voted for it. I haven't thought about this proposal. It's an interesting one. Um, and I would say here um, um, the prediction market mechanism could help a lot because if you define um, um, or if you make the decision whether or not to implement this proposal based on the forecast for, of, the, of the value of the DAO token, well, this pro uh, proposition will for sure drive the value of the DAO token down because, or basically to zero. So I would say uh, on this market, um, this uh, future key mechanism is way more resilient uh, against such an attack than the voting mechanism, where really those who don't, uh, um, who are just offline for two weeks and don't uh, um, follow up, are just uh, screwed. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Push humans to decisions because not everyone has time to get real information. Mm -hmm. And here, no law is there to um, prevent right. people. Right, so, so the question was, um, or the comment was, that price mani manipulation might be easier than, than we think, uh, especially because you, uh, you can have marketing campaign or an email list or some community you form around and use to uh, manipulate something. First of all, I don't have a final answer to it, so of course, might be right. Uh, maybe it, it will not work, uh, for, of course. Um, but there is still an important um, thing that I would consider. So in a lot of, in a lot of cases where price manipulation is happening and is possible, it might be of a lack of uh, short against this price. So the typical example is, I mean, we all know these altcoins that pump and dump things. So if there is only, um, uh, yeah, I mean, 10 people create a new coin, they have all the coins, uh, they put it on a marketplace, and they can completely uh, control the, the, the demand, uh, the, the, um, how, how, how many coins are offered on this marketplace. So even if they can just, through a marketing campaign, convince some people to buy it, uh, since they control the supply um, and they can keep the supply at artificially low or they can kind of paint the price in, by, by just um, buying and selling at a very high level but only doing trades with, with each other, and, and kind of creating the impression to others that um, that that the thing is, is valued so and so much because it's uh, kind of fake trades on a high price level. Um, this is all working because there is no real um, mechanism for someone to short it. So if someone say uh, would would say, well, this is new altcoin, or this is I mean there were tons of coins that basically just copied. Uh, Bitcoin and, and changed three parameters and gave it a new logo and here we go. Um, so there, there was no option to make money out of, out of your opinion that this coin will not have some big value in a year. Um, with the prediction market, it's always the case that you can bet against it. Um, it's always the case that um, you... Uh, yeah, you can make money. Um, uh, uh, yeah, out of out of the the failure, and um, and there's also it, it, it's not it's not this self fulfilling prof or the self fulfilling prophecy in a price mechanism. So if you have a stock, then um, it is valued um, 
if, if more people buy it, it just becomes more valuable and therefore more people buy it and it becomes more valuable and there is no there is not this uh, uh, point in time where kind of the value gets where where there is this um, uh, ch reality check kind of and with a prediction market you usually have you define an event in the future so for example in a year how much will our rev will the revenue of the DAO be and um, and of course, at some point you can manipulate uh, the price, but eventually this, there, there is this real reality check, and eventually it will be one or zero. Um, and if you are at this point uh, skeptical, you have uh, uh, the option to make money out of it. So I would say we will see. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe. So I think one of the problems with uh, futures markets is that uh, people don't know how much capital can actually be deployed into the market at any given time. They know the open interest, long and short positions, but they don't know if someone can just come in, a liquidity provider can mm -hmm. come in and just put in you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So perhaps one suggestion is for you to somehow cap the um, and create a transparent uh, amount of, of maximum liquidity mm -hmm. that revolves around the, the decision making process so that um, basically as people make, make decisions they, they can sort of see um, you know how much you know uh, uh, profits or, or losses can be made and thus sort of have sort of a more transparent um, understanding mm -hmm. of, of, of where the market is going or where the market could potentially be taken because there's a finite amount of liquidity that can be injected into that particular decision. So, so there are uh, two things. I, I would, I wouldn't restrict the money that is into market. I would always restrict the money you can lose or, or win, and, and that is usually the case with the prediction market. So your risk is always known up front. Um, well, yeah. No, what I, I mean, not an individual can put in, but the actual yeah. market, like the, the, the cap of the entire market. But but that, I, I would say that would open the door to manipulation because then you know if you can if you can reach this cap, um, you could say well uh, I, I I just buy it up and and then I reach uh, the cap is reached and kind of the prices can't move because no additional capital um, can go in. So I'm not sure about about that. Brian, maybe one one or more two one one more question or yeah, what's yeah. your okay. Yeah, it's really Okay, or right. I see two two hands raised, so let's have these two questions. You. Um, just uh, fact checking. So, if I understand it correctly, um, you prevent high frequency trading or arbitrage given high frequency trading through your system. Um, that is um, that is something I'm I'm interested in. So, the, but but it's really a di different topic, I would say. Or so so on on this um, prediction market, there are little rules how the trading is exactly done, um, and actually those yes no tokens they can be traded in principle on different marketplaces, and in some marketplaces might allow high frequency trading. I'm personally very. In I, I think high uh, frequency trading is a loser, uh, or that, that most people lose money, and it's just uh, unnecessary uh, zero-sum games where only the fastest profit. And we should get rid of it, and we should have better mechanisms like uh, batch auctions, bundle all bits and offers of, um, over a specific period, then have a single price clearing. But that's kind of a different topic, I would say. Okay, I think there was the last question. Yeah, yeah building, building on the, the comment we have previously, isn't the actual lack of the, uh, liquidity the, the, the problem that brings market moving actors into the, into the whole game? Because when you create a derivative of a stock, mm -hmm. the derivative is much more easily uh, manipulated than the stock itself, say Apple and the derivative on Apple. Um, and wouldn't it be then the, the reverse? Saying like you need a certain minimum liquidity <laughs> in the in the process, otherwise it's just going to reverse the process again until there is a minimum liquidity. Yeah, very good point. So uh, I would also say if if the market um, if really the market is the mechanism that will trigger the decision, 
um, then enough liquidity is, is necessary. So um, there's this concept of automated market makers uh, that can be a contract themselves. And the more money they have initially, uh, the more money is re required to, to, move, to move the price. Uh, yeah, good, good point. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I will be around for a few more minutes. And Who here invested in the dollar?